No, it's <laughs> not as and big as long as you're not playing with somebody else. Right. <laughs> if you have a whole group of people, fine. But two people. Good evening. Yeah. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Fairdale on this Friday night. We are glad that you all are here. It's Good Friday. It means it's Easter weekend. And this is an unusual service for us. We don't normally or typically have church on Friday nights. But we wanted to this week as a preparation for what is coming Easter Sunday. It's Good Friday. We're going to have a service tonight where we focus in on what the Bible teaches us about Jesus dying on the cross. Christ crucified. If you would, turn to the Bible to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to start our service tonight by reading a really long passage, 54 verses from the Gospel of Matthew on the death of Jesus. While you're turning to Matthew 27, I want to just remind you yet again, by now you've heard it all, but remind you yet again of all that we have planned for Easter weekend. Uh, Because of the weather last weekend, the big egg hunt, the community egg hunt, has been moved to tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we'll have a lot of volunteers working, and at the Fairdale High School football field, we will have an egg hunt at 1130. Everybody is invited. Tomorrow morning, before all of that, at 8 o'clock, we have our men's prayer breakfast. And then on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, outside the front of the church there, we will have a sunrise service at 7 a.m. If you've never been to a sunrise service before, I encourage you to come If it's not too cloudy, we will actually see the sun come up uh, as we worship the risen Jesus on Sunday morning. There will be no Sunday school on Sunday morning, but we will have our main service in here at 1045. In between those two services, which are two totally different services, they're different sermons and all that, uh, we will provide breakfast here at church to anybody that wants that. Okay, It's a busy weekend at Easter, but Christ is certainly worthy. We welcome you here tonight. We're going to focus in now on the death of Jesus. Look with me at Matthew chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and brought with them and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, And they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. 
Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hell, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head, And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, They divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers were crucified with him, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, you are our God. And your son Jesus is truly the son of God, the one slain for our sins. But Father, even in reading this story, we hear, we feel, we get that he didn't deserve to die. It was done out of love for us. And we praise you for that. God, we're not normally here on Friday nights, but this night we've gathered to worship you. We focus in that you died for us. and We ask your blessing on this service now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Do you stand and sing with us? Sinner, come and 
may be seated. If you would, turn in the Bible to Revelation chapter 1. For many of you all, you should be able to find it. We've been in Revelation for the last several Sundays. I want to draw our attention back tonight to one very small phrase that's very fitting for a Good Friday service. A Good Friday service is intended to focus in on Christ crucified, the death of Jesus. A Good Friday service is intended to help us focus. For us to fully embrace the resurrection of Christ, we must understand the crucifixion of Christ. No one living has ever been able to teach us or enlighten us on death from experience. I want you to think about that for a moment. No one. We talk about death, we fear death, we feel emotional over death, we wonder about death, but no one living has ever been able to teach us or enlighten us on death from experience. No one. But in Revelation chapter 1, if you will look all the way over to verse 18, we see a most remarkable statement. In verse 18, it's the second half of a sentence, Jesus says, and the living one, but then here's our phrase for tonight, I died. Nobody's ever really been able to say that like Christ does here, I died. Five letters, two words. Jesus here is speaking on death from the other side of it. He's saying, I died, and he's past the death. You and I may have a lot of conversations about death. We may prepare for it, but we're still on this side of dying. And in the book of Revelation, in the first chapter, when John is telling us what he saw, Jesus says, I died. That's not normal. Allow yourself to think on that for a moment. A living man here says, I died. Truth be told, no one living really knows all that much about death. It is mysterious. It is that curious. It is that unknown. All of us are living on this side of death, wondering about it, maybe ignoring it or avoiding it, or maybe, as the song mentioned, fearing it. But it is God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, I died. Simple and plain. When I told our church secretary that's going to be the title of the sermon tonight, she literally laughed out loud. There wasn't a lot of thought that went into that one. I died. This simple statement. Simple statement, right? Five letters again. But isn't it enormous for us? Did he really die and tell us about it afterward? Did he really die and come back and live forever? Is he alive now? And if so, how massive is that? Enormous. This Easter weekend and this Good Friday is for us to focus on the details of why he died. 
There's a lot of good studies on the death of Christ. We can talk about who killed him. That's a good conversation, isn't it? We can talk about all the things that happened leading up to it, the betrayal and the mocking and the clothing and all of that. We can talk about his sayings. You've probably heard of his seven final statements that he said on the cross. You've heard of, I thirst and Father forgive them. You've heard of, um, it is finished. But tonight I want us to look at why did this happen? Why did this happen? We're going to read some more scripture because this is a unique service. And so we're going to read even more than we would normally But our focus tonight is why did Jesus die? Number one, number one, God wanted Jesus to die. God wanted Jesus to die. It was God's plan. The conversation that you and I have about wants usually leads to distinguishing between wants and needs. And all parents have had that conversation with their kids before. Is that a want or is that a need? Do you have to have it? But with God, he can bring about everything he wants. He does all that he pleases, the scriptures teach us. God wanted Jesus to die. By that, I mean he willed for Jesus to die. He designed it. He planned it. He brought it about and he made it happen. God wanted Jesus to die. I I want you to turn, please, to Isaiah 53. And this is a passage that you need to know Easter week anyway. We're going to read just a few verses. We're going to start at Isaiah 53. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. If you're not familiar with this, y'all, this is an Old Testament prophet well before Christ had come to earth telling us what would happen to Jesus. This is a very clear prophecy. Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. See, y'all, this is beautiful prophecy because God is teaching Isaiah the prophet to write this before Christ was a man. Christ is God, so he's eternal, but he didn't become a human being until the incarnation, what we celebrate at Christmas. And here Isaiah's telling us what would happen to him well before it happened. It's awesome. We believe. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Look at this. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see there in verse 6 that it is the Lord's doing. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out, cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Look at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Does everybody see that? It was the will of the Lord to crush him. God has put him to grief. Later in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, with Peter preaching at Pentecost, we hear Peter say this, this Jesus 
delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This crucified Savior died because his Father wanted him to. God wanted Jesus to die. And any time you find yourself in awe or standing amazed at the beauty of anything, you'll ask questions like, wow, whose idea was this? Who designed this? Who invented this? This is brilliant. This is wonderful. This is so good. I'm thankful that they did. When we think about our salvation... You and I are to go back to this was the Father's plan. It was God's plan for His Son to die for the sins of the world. Our great salvation, the freedom that there is in Christ, freedom from the bondage and the grip of sin, is God's doing. He wanted that. Our God and Father designed purposed and planned for his son to die in our place, there is no greater love than what we see in the plan of God for his son to die. There is no more amazing grace than what we see in the plan of God for his son to die. That is the good news, that Jesus Christ, the godly, died for us, the ungodly, And it was his father, our father, it was God, the one true and living God's plan for him to die. Number one, God wanted Jesus to die. Number two, Satan worked for Jesus to die. He was wanting to kill Jesus. He was operating to have Jesus killed. It was his plan. Now, the Bible does a lot of teaching us about Satan, but at the same time, there's a lot about Satan that we don't quite understand. And I want to show you a few pieces of this, okay? We know that Satan has always, from as soon as we learn about him in the book of Genesis all the way until the very end, we know that he is the author of evil and the father of evil and that he is the one wanting to bring about all things bad and all things not good and all things dying. That's what he's trying to do. He's destructive. You might recall the words of Jesus in John chapter 10 when Jesus says that he came to bring us life and abundant life, but that the devil, who he calls the thief, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the character of Satan. He likes to steal. He likes to take things from people. He likes to kill. He likes to end life. He likes to destroy. He likes to disrupt. That's what Satan does. And anywhere in your life where you can sense disruption and you can sense negativity and you can sense, I don't like this, and you can sense that things are not the way they're supposed to be, you can recognize that Satan probably has a foot involved there, that he's working. Satan wanted to end Jesus. He wanted to do away with him. You might recall the temptations from early in the Gospels where he's tempting Jesus, trying to get Jesus off the path of making it to the cross that we celebrate tonight. In John chapter 13, the passage that tells us of the Last Supper, the passage that was the week of the Passion Week, just hours before Christ would be rejected, Christ would be betrayed with a kiss. In that passage in John chapter 13, we are told that Satan entered into Judas. Satan entered into Judas. Judas was an apostle who then would betray Christ, betrayed him with a kiss in the garden, betrayed him so that those guys could go and arrest him, so they could take Jesus and ultimately beat him up and kill him, nail him to a cross. Satan was working for Jesus to die. I don't know how much Satan knew of the great plan of God, but Satan certainly knew that Jesus was God. We're taught that the demons believe and tremble. We see the demons recognizing Christ throughout the Gospels. They wanted to 
change his path. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to end him. Satan worked for Jesus to die. Number three, God wanted Jesus to die. Number two, Satan worked for Jesus to die. But number three, Jesus willingly died. If the plan of God is not remarkable enough for you, this goes along with the plan of God because Jesus is God. He's the second person of the Godhead. He's the Son of God, and he's also one and the same with God. He and his Father are connected. There's only one true God, and that God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's very similar when we say that God planned for him to die and Jesus willingly died. You remember the passage in Matthew 26 where Christ is praying in the garden. And he says those monumental words, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. Christ knew that he came to die. In that passage of John 13 where Satan enters into Judas, at the beginning of that passage in John 13, it says Jesus knew that his time had come to depart out of this world and go back to his father where he had come. Christ knew that the plan of God before the foundation of the world was for God to be a savior, for the God to be a savior through the sacrifice of his son. We know that Jesus willingly died because we see this played out in a lot of different ways. Another one you remember is that as Christ was hanging on the cross, we see him thinking through lots of things. We see him thinking through forgiveness. We see him dealing with the agony of taking the wrath of God. But we hear him express, it is finished. That unforgettable cry, that statement that it was done. What was done? The plan of God to deal with sin. The way sin is supposed to be dealt with. Sin can't be dealt with lightly. It's worse than you and I could ever imagine. When a holy, loving God, when a creator that made you and I, that loves us and cares for us and wants the best for us, loves us and cares for us and wants the best for us, when we sin against him, it's bad. It's not right. It's not good. It's way out of line, and it ought to be dealt with and corrected, and it has been dealt with and corrected, and it will be dealt with and corrected. But God sent his son to die for the sins of the world, and when we hear him say, it is finished, we see this. You also might recall Philippians chapter 2 when we're told that he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus willingly died. That conversation that we read a little bit of of Jesus and the governor in Matthew 27 where they ask, are you a king and are you the savior and all of that? And Jesus' answers weren't always the most clear thing in the world. Sometimes he didn't even answer. Sometimes he said, you said so. And sometimes he said, do what you got to do. One of the reasons why it went down that way is because the most important thing that needed to be accomplished in that moment was for them to take him and end his life. And so Christ willingly, faithfully, obediently, lovingly died for us. It was a true sacrifice. Him for us. That is what Good Friday is about, the death of Jesus. That's why it is good he died for us. Our third point here this evening is that he willingly died. Number one, God wanted him to die. Number two, Satan worked for him to die. Number three, Jesus willingly died. Number four, we worship him because he died. If you're not careful, Christianity will become to you 
simply just another man who is inspirational. The pep talk every morning for you, the kick in the pants or the pat on the back, the kiss on the forehead or the high five that motivates you to keep going another day. If you're not careful, Christianity will just turn to you, will just turn in your life of whatever gets you going. And the world is filled with people who are just looking for whatever to keep them going. For some it's money, for some it's acceptance, for some it's coffee. Everybody's trying to figure out what's their motivation. The work of Jesus on the cross is a motivation for us. But it's a lot more before it's that. It's the redeeming work of sinful people. We worship him for that. We lift our hands, we lift our voices, we bow our hearts, and we surrender our lives to Jesus because he died for us. He died for our sins. He died for our judgment. He died for our punishment. He died to help us. He died to save us. He died to bring us to God. He died so that we would know him and we worship him because he died. It's the very, very, very central teaching point of Christianity. If you read 1 Corinthians, you will see Paul telling that Corinthian church time and time again in different ways, this is foolishness to the world, but we are about the cross. The wisdom of the world and the keys of life are different for people that don't know redemption. But for those who are being saved, it is a man hanging on a cross, giving his life and his body and his blood for the sins of the world. That is the hope. That's the purpose that is the most important thing in the world for us in the next chapter of 1st Corinthians he would say his strategy is plain and simple we preach Christ crucified we worship him because he died for us to the Galatians Paul would write I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. What a belief, what a faith, what a testimony, what a message, what a motivating factor in your life. We worship him because he died for us and because of that relationship and faith, we are motivated. If you look back to Revelation chapter 1, and we see that I died statement in verse 18, but I want you to look back earlier in chapter 1, when he's just hearing at verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Now look at this next little description. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He loves us. He freed us by his blood. God is working in the world through the lives of people like us who have come to believe that Christ died for us and we worship him for that. That's why we are a church. That's why we gather. That's what this is tonight, and this is what we will blow the doors open with on Sunday morning, that he died for us. 
death has been dealt with, sin has been dealt with, judgment has been dealt with, punishment has been dealt with, the wrath of God has been dealt with, all in the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. We worship for that. We will not die. We will not be judged. We will not be punished. We will live forever with him because he died for us. We worship him for that. We recognize in in Jesus Christ worth on worth on worth, value on value on value. He is the most worthy thing in the world to us. We love him. We will not be ashamed. We will not lose sight. We will have courage. We will seek to obey. We will aim to live for him. We worship him because he died. Number one, God wanted Jesus to die. Number two, Satan worked for Jesus to die. Number three, Jesus willingly died. And number four, we worship him because he died. And number five, in closing, We also worship him because he did not stay dead. He lives. He is alive right now. And I was ready to preach to you all tonight, and I am also ready to preach Sunday morning because we're going to be back in Revelation, and we are going to see the super redundant phrase throughout the book of Revelation that says, he lives, he lives, he lives, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. You can say all you want anywhere in the world, no matter what country or language you are at or speaking, whatever you think about religion and whatever you think about people, but if Jesus is alive, he reigns if he's alive and there's witnesses throughout the ages he has never had a time without witnesses it's been passed down from the day that he came back to life he lives you are foolish out of your mind to not believe that the risen Christ lives even now we worship him for that the tomb is empty if you look back to chapter 1 verse 17 Look what he says. It's it's interesting. At verse 17, he says, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. In that statement that has uh, prompted the whole sermon tonight, I died, he makes sure in case anybody misses it, Before he says he died, he says, I'm alive. And after he says I died, he says, I'm alive. You're okay with knowing that Jesus died, but don't you ever, 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 ever leave it at that. That's why it's a real small point for us. But that's why when we hang a cross, Jesus isn't on it anymore. Other denominations like their crosses to have him still on it. We like to have him off of it. He's not on it. He wasn't on it very long. They took him down off of it. They buried him in the grave, and he came back to life, and he reigns. He lives. There where he says, I died, he says, I'm alive. I'm alive forevermore. That is what the focus will be on Sunday morning. 7 a.m. outside, 1045 inside. Let's be ready to worship the living Jesus. He died, and now he lives. But I want to make something even more clear tonight. You have to believe that his death was for yours. This isn't a class that you came to tonight. We're not here to show you just what we think. We're not studying some topic tonight. We're talking about the one who died and lived. We're listening to him tell us what it's like. And so you have to believe in him. You have to believe that the reason why he died is because you're going to die. And you have to believe that the reason why he died is because he wanted to alter what happens when you die. You have to believe that your sins are what caused his death. You have to believe that it was for sin that he died. See, the Bible teaches us very clearly that the wages of sin is death. It's sinners that die. But Jesus didn't sin. 
And so there's no way he could have died. Had God not ultimately or at some point put the sins of the world on Jesus on the cross, he could have hung there forever. He wouldn't have given out of breath. He wouldn't have become too tired. He wouldn't have just given up. He could not have died. You can't die if you don't sin. And he never did sin. So how did he die? What made him stop breathing? What made his lungs give out? What made his legs give out? What made his life end? Your sins, my sins, our sins, the world's sins. And you, in a personal, individual way, need to deal with that. You need to think, well, do I believe that? You have to believe that your sins are what caused his death, and you have to believe that his death was for your death. And if you truly do believe that, you will get his life. He will take your death, and you will take his life. You will be saved by God. You will be saved with life forever eternal life. You'll live forever in heaven with God. Your death will be the smoothest transition you've ever faced. You will take that last breath and be with God forever. The one who loves you more than anybody else. But you do have to believe that. There aren't tickets or passports. There aren't buses or train rides. There aren't airplanes. There aren't even spaceships to get you to God. But there is a death of the holy, worthy Son of God. We worship him for that. He died for us. And we worship him for that because he's alive. Revelation 1, 17 and 18 says, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died Behold, I am alive forevermore. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the death of Christ. Thank you, God, for all that it means, the wise. Thank you for planning that. Thank you that Satan trying to stop it only fed right into what your plan was. We see the limitations of Satan in his efforts. Thank you for the willingness of Jesus. God, thank you that we now can see why it all happened and worship from it. Oh, Father, help us to say, I believe it. Help us to say, I need that salvation. Help us to say, I know that I sinned in causing that and to believe in you. Oh, Father, work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Then, would you stand as we sing? Pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon me. And by his wounds, and by his wounds, we are healed.
He was pierced for our transgressions He was crushed for our sins The punishment that brought us peace Was upon me And by His wounds And by His wounds we are here We are here
We're going to end the service tonight by hearing Jesus speak about how we can think through death. At John chapter 11, we read this. Now when Jesus came, he found, the Lazar- he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mar- Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. May you believe that God loves you and sent his son to die for you. And upon believing that, even though you die, you will live. Happy Good Friday. We'll see you Sunday. You're dismissed. Have a good night.